There's no place to escape to. This is the last oh, yes. on the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. on a top it. Oh! <laughs> yeah! Oh, so, so in your mind, Andrew Kunanen is actually Andrew Dice Clay. Oh! Yeah. oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the last podcast on the left, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marcus Parks with Henry Zabrowski yeah. and Ed Larson. Hey! How's everyone doing? Happy Halloween. Happy Whatever. spooky time. It's spooky time. I know. I know. We should be embracing. It, I, that, so I wanted to do a treat because, you know, I, God bless the whole thing we're doing here, you know, but, I, you know, he's not scary. You know, he's, no, he's fucking terrifying. Uh, I find Andrew Cunanan to be extremely yeah, terrifying. Yeah, but you can't dress up as him for Halloween. What are you really going to wear? That's sort of the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shave your head, wireframe glasses, bullet hole in the center of your head and your forehead. Yeah. Okay, there it is, folks. So come out to the uh, <laughs> beach bike and bingo dresses, Andrew Cunanan. But I wanted to do some, uh, some, uh, some I like cheesy Halloween jokes. You're allowed sure. to do it. You're All right. Allowed. This is, so I, so this you're, is you're something allowed. I, I, I prepared material. I feel like this is a good, you know, like, you know, side in, take 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 your shot. Take your shot at the mic. Take yeah. your shot. Take All right, you ready? You ready? Okay. All right. Why does Candyman have bees? Why does Candyman have bees? Why? Why? Because he didn't study hard enough for A's. <laughs> Come on, what are we doing here? I, I don't know, man. Okay, okay, he said, a... he's like, I remember right before we started recording, he's like, you gotta let me try his Halloween beer. <laughs> he's a good, he's a good, this is good material. All right, fucking, we gotta get to the story. So, back, uh, uh, where, it... where does the mummy like to have sex? Where? In his sphinxster. All right, and what's Freddy Krueger's favorite horse to bet on at the track? What? A nightmare, you fucking idiots. <laughs> That's right. A Don't nightmare. insult me. A nightmare. How did you not know? I, How did you not know the answer? <laughs> because I'm not sitting and thinking like I'm Harry Shackleman. A nightmare. A mare is a horse, and the nightmare there, is where he kills children. So when we last left Andrew Kunan, <laughs> you can expect... A lot, of, a lot more of that at the LPN Beach Blanket Bingo, That's right. uh, October 20th in San Diego. Yeah, so. so when we last left Andrew Cunanan, he was in Minnesota visiting his friend Mark Trail after Cunanan convinced himself that he'd been infected with HIV. I got deeper into like the, the run up because I remember like I, I was catching up in the book Vulgar Favors to kind of see more like there was the atmosphere of what what was going on inside of Andrew Cunanan's. If you listen to every other reporter's like pronunciation of Kunanan? his name. I hate it. Kunanan. I don't know. Cause I remember it was like Kunani or oh, Mr. Kunani, but I don't understand why they, it was like, how do you get Kunanan yeah. out of Tunan? Perhaps that's how it is actually said in the Philippines. It is only reporters. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> be the killer. Be the killer. Be the killer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Andrew Kunanan, when he was leading up to, we talked about the idea that he had a, like a going away party, what he called his last supper. Yeah. But it, there was things that led up to that that I found really, really interesting. Is that he, Yes, he got sort of, one of the books of our, one of our sources got, was really focused in on Andrew Kunanan's fear that he was infected with HIV. Vulgar Favors was when we're talking about he creating an atmosphere where he was, it was no longer tenable for him to be amongst his friends that he had built over like the last decade. Yeah. He had become manic, crazy, uh, obviously violent, but there really was the rampant spending. At the very end of his time in San Francisco, he ended up, he racked up something like $45,000 on an Amex. And when you do that, honestly, we were talking about right before the show, Amex is real forgiving. These motherfuckers. They let you charge anything. You can just tell them how much money you make and they will believe you. They just believe you. So, But at some point, when you don't pay, they start to get like, mad yeah, like that's yeah. where the express comes in yeah. where they start yeah. showing up but he really was like uh he had become nuts he became a favorite amongst all of these like top level restaurants where he would sit and him alone would spend or maybe with one other friend he'd spend something like twelve hundred dollars fifteen hundred dollars on a single dinner buying three hundred dollar bottle of wine doing all this crazy shit and literally spending thousands of dollars on desserts alone yeah so he became the sugar dad he became filled with sugar daddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, while Andrew was in Minneapolis, 
He bumped into an old boyfriend named David Madsen. And soon enough, Andrew, Mark, and David had formed a temporary friend circle that got very intense very quickly. But after a particularly humiliating run-in with Lisa Kudrow at a nightclub, which made Andrew furious, he returned to San Diego to find that his charm had worn off on all his old friends and contacts. Andrew soon found himself effectively alone, save for a platonic friend named Eric Greenman, who for some reason moved into a studio apartment with this increasingly unstable individual. I wouldn't do that with a dog. (laughs) (laughs) He, like, imagine now, he went from super fancy, fun. We all have had friends like this, especially in the comedy scene, especially in show business. All of the attributes that made this guy fun are now making him extremely scary. He is telling wilder and wilder lies. More and more people are like, you're lying, Andrew. They're just saying it to his face now. He is shaving his head. He has gained a lot of weight. He's wearing he's wearing disheveled clothes. His, he is becoming really, really crazy. But I think that Eric Greenman basically got floated by Andrew. Mm-hmm. Like that's what because so he would keep people within his circle by just handing out Money, pulling out $400, $500 out of the ATM at a time. And no one had any idea where this fucking money was coming from. Yeah. Well, over the course of the few months that they lived together, Greenman saw that Kunanen was becoming increasingly manic and bizarre. Although Greenman did backtrack some of his statements later by saying that the tabloids had encouraged him to spice up his story with juicier details. Amongst those maybe true, maybe not details was a shrine that Andrew had supposedly built to Tom Cruise. Love it. According to Greenman, Kunanen... It's not the only one out there. (laughs) According to Greenman, Kunanen would say that he loved Tom Cruise so much that he wanted to tie him up, use him, and make him beg for more, which gives you an idea of Andrew Kunanen's idea of love. Honestly, you get him died down, right? Because, you know, he kind of likes the lack of responsibility. It's just by finally somebody else making a decision for me. And then, you know what? I just bring in one hole uncut snapper because we know what he likes and I just plop 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 I fish light him for several days and then he'll be mad well adding to that Kunanen said quote did you notice Tom ages like a fine wine he's the perfect boy toy that's my dream lover and I don't want a dream no more come here Tommy <laughs> I almost feel bad he couldn't see him now because he still looks great he's yeah no <laughs> yeah. oh, wherever you are Kunani if you could just see how great Tom's doing he's saving the movies <laughs> Conversely, though, Kunanen hated Nicole Kidman, mm. who was still married to Tom Cruise at the time. A stupid driving movie. Did you see that? The tiny <laughs> car going to her pussy. was like, you're stinky. Get away from it. <laughs> well, about Kidman, Kunanen said, quote, I'd like to kill her so I can have Tom to myself. Oh, wow. And then what? <laughs> oh, wow. He started throwing those a lot. That was like yeah. one of the things people notice is that any like towards especially the end of his time in California, whenever anybody said anything about having a problem with somebody, he's like, well, maybe we should kill him and then he'll get rid of them. Like mm-hmm. he started having it's just super light comedy. Yeah. <laughs> In what became increasingly obsessive behavior, Kunan once rented five Tom Cruise movies and watched them all in one night. each one better than the last. (laughs) Yes, yes. Been there, done that, baby. Yeah? Yeah. No, probably not. (laughs) (laughs) Not with Tom Snooze. (laughs) And he carefully studied each Tom Cruise scene, noting Tom Cruise's gestures. (laughs) 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 But after that came Andrew Cunanan's trademark boundary crossing behavior. One day, Greenman walked into their studio apartment to find Andrew watching hardcore porn featuring a guy strapped to a chair being tortured by a cattle prod. Have you ever seen Angus Beef? <laughs> I, you never, you've never seen this? This is a good one. This is where he says, hey, stop it with the cattle prod. <laughs> I love this guy. Before Greenman had a chance to react, Andrew reportedly said, Hey, Eric, look at what I'd like to do to Tom Cruise. <laughs> Hey, (laughs) that's what I'm going to do to him. Walking into his studio apartment after work. Just like, man, please let me. 
I told you, not in the living room. Yeah, well, there <laughs> is in the living room. Thing's <laughs> the living room. <laughs> God, it's so hard. Put a hard. sock on the door. God, yes. it's so hard to be watching hardcore pornography in a studio apartment you share with somebody. You could have oh. been sitting on the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> with the door open. Yeah. It's like, hey, I'm in the vestibule. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, later that night, as Andrew was on his way out the door, <laughs> on his way to a gay bar, <laughs> he continued the references, saying, quote, You could say I'm Tom Cruise. Ooh. Yeah, yeah, I knew you'd yeah. like that pun. I love a murderer, that pun. <laughs> yeah. What, you know, what, once there was a general, I, I thought, uh, uh, the order code red, and, uh, but I was just Tom accusing. You are. We can flush it. We can flush it. Flush it. We can cut it. We can cut it. We can cut it. You know, how about, how about this? There was one time I was stuck in detention with a bunch of friends, you know, and, uh-huh. and then we, and then we didn't know each other, but then we all became friends uh-huh. and I was John Husing. <laughs> Breakfast. Better. It's a breakfast club. It is. <laughs> That's better. That is better. That's better. Now, as far as Kunanen's obsession with Tom Cruise went, friends later said that he had the same obsession with Gianni Versace. Mm. Based on this statement, I actually think it's possible that Andrew Kunanen's first choice for a highly famous target was Tom Cruise. He felt like he was building up a fantasy of what he would do. Well, because, building up a fantasy that was designed to fail. Yes, yeah. because who he can get in contact with? Because what we what do we know about Andrew Cunanan? He definitely wanted to be famous no matter what. Mm-hmm. Multiple, multiple people said that he would tell people, he's just like, I just know I'm going to be famous. I don't know what it is because I don't like do anything, but I know I'm going to be famous one day. But I think that he started to kind of connect this idea of like, maybe you just need to sort of explode next to a famous person. Yeah. And then if you do that, like, then it's like you get put on their Wikipedia page. You get do, you get included in all of the noise about them. Your face next to, gets to be next to their face for the rest of time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We, I think it'd be great if he tried to kill Tom Cruise and then David Miscavige just fought him. Man, <laughs> and they like, <laughs> hit you in the crossbody. <laughs> like, and Andrew Cunanan, oh like, what a, that's a fucking March Madness. We got to put that in this year. <laughs> The first round, Andrew Cunanan versus David Miscavige. Man, they, the, the blows back and forth because David Miscavige is tough. <laughs> like, 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 like a little Wolverine. Dude, you're like, but Andrew Cunanan, honestly, he had length. He, yeah. had yeah. length. he was taller, so he could probably, you know, you mush his face and be like, back, bitch. And then, like, <laughs> you pull him in, you just, how easy it is to kick David Miscavige in the face. Yeah. <laughs> but when it became obvious that Tom Cruise was impossible to reach, it's possible that Cunanan just went down the list one more name to someone who was far more vulnerable to attack, as we'll see in episode three. Now, Kunanen was still trying to keep all of his various personas like Andrew De Silva and Lieutenant Commander Cummings. He was trying to keep all that alive in San Diego. But from what people who knew him said, Kunanen came across as a man who was drowning. Where before he'd taken good care of himself, Kunanen had, in early 1997, quickly gained 20 pounds. Not just because of the fancy desserts, but because he was spending so much time eating Oreos and Doritos while smoking cigars and drinking beer. This guy got this guy. I know. He sounds cool. I know. (laughs) That's not too far from what we do. Just sitting there eating Oreos or watching the fucking most hardcore torture porn you can imagine. Just Just smart. But he used to mix them. Like, he used to literally mix it into a slurry. Ugh. He would sit and he got... But they said that, that it was really interesting because he really went from this fake non-gauche guy where he... The whole thing was that he was fancy. He had super, super elevated tastes. He would wear things that were like but what rich people do where they don't really wear labels necessarily as they wear things you would recognize that other rich people wear. And so it's, it's a code that they do amongst rich people where something like this, he started to truly devolve, which is why, like... They called it the gay death at, mm. at the time. Like his friends were because he let himself go so thoroughly. Like he cut his f- hair that everyone was like famous. He was like famously cute for. He, and then when he gained the weight, it wasn't so much the weight gain that was like the problem. It was that he was smoking meth five times a day and still managed to gain a lot of weight. That's a lot of Oreos. J- yeah. Literally just eating desserts and drinking champagne. Like that's like. That's difficult. That's He's Oprah in- Winfrey style. Like oh, uh, the the whole mac and cheese. Yes, yeah, yeah. That's a very very difficult thing to do. But it showed that he was um, he really w- it's again truly spiraling. Yeah, he was in his thirties mm. at this point. I think he was late in his 20, tw- late twenties. Yeah, and you're spiraling before your thirties. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't. Your twenties, you could can do anything. In your yeah, body. your thirties yeah. are the best decade of your life. Yeah. 
Additionally, Andrew was depending more on dealing hard drugs and sex work for income. He also started to dress like shit, all of which made finding a new sugar daddy a near impossibility. In other words, Kunanin had gone from the fanciest boy at Gamma Moo to a crumb-covered, somehow chubby meth head. It's, it's, honestly, it's kind of inspiring. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta you gotta dig in. You gotta yeah. look for that brass ring. It's so hard, like because all these factors are working against you. The meth, that's it. Still chubby. It's still chubby, man. It's incredible. It is wild. It is wild. I actually got a good conspiracy email about this. Uh, I thought it was interesting. Um, I was listening to the Cunanan episode when you guys brought up Gat Mamu, the frat. I was like, why is it familiar? The primary antagonist in an extremely goofy movie is a member of a frat called Gamma Mumu. And the movie is set in the 90s, which means that Bradley Uppercrust III is canonically a closeted, wealthy gay man. And he's saying that it's just too close. What are you talking about? I have no idea what any of that means. Is this the <laughs> sequel to the Goofy movie? That is the, the Goofy movie. Yeah, I believe it is well, the Goofy sequel. Goofy loved to fuck cows. <laughs> we know that. What? Yeah, his girlfriend was a cow. Yeah. And he was a dog. Yeah. No way. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. You well, he was, beautiful. A, he was an elevated dog. He's not going to fuck Pluto. Is yeah. that? <laughs> you know, is that? <laughs> Pluto's kind of like Kunan. So you yeah, talk Pluto's closer to Kunan. So are you talking about like old school Goofy, like really funny Goofy? Because yeah. Goofy movie Goofy, like Goofy, are you talking, because because his son is another dog. Max. Max, yeah. Max is a dog. Yes. So was like the woman that he was having sex with after Max's mother, I don't know, did she die? Maybe Clarabelle, you know, I, I think actually, is still alive. I, <laughs> I thought it was suicide. Like, oh, oh, Max's yeah. mother. Yeah, yeah, just thinking about, you know, just God knows. God knows what goes on. Walk in that straight dog's head. off a cliff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she'd keep going. <laughs> <laughs> well, that helped, right? Yeah. <laughs> that helped the flow? Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, realizing that a new sugar daddy was a near impossibility, Kunanen returned to old sugar daddies to see if they would once again make him their kept boy. Kunanen was, of course, rejected, but I'd say that those old men were very lucky that none of them became Kunanen's first murder victim. I think that they read the writing on the wall. Yeah. They saw he, he was very obviously in distress. Mm -hmm. It seems like this kept boy is going to start screaming more. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> kind of a kept maniac, but I don't want to keep a maniac. Now, by April of 1997, rumors were swirling around San Diego that Kunanen was HIV positive. So he made claims that he was moving to San Francisco so that the rumors would die down. But it's also around this time that Kunanen had another run in with a celebrity, his last before everything fell apart. See, by this point, Kunanen was drinking heavily for the first time in his life, but he still managed to talk his way into an event where he could bother Elizabeth Hurley. Oh, you no. bastard. You leave her alone. <laughs> <laughs> she is still beautiful at 59. Elizabeth Hurley is one of the most beautiful women who's ever walked here. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> now, again, Kunanen claimed to adore Elizabeth Hurley. Sure. He said, what a vamp. But instead of humoring Andrew, like Lisa Kudrow did for a time... That's because she's an entertainer more than an actor. Mm -hmm. Hurley just ignored him. Yeah, Looked sure. right over his yeah, head. As, she, as you should. Yeah. Yep. Again, Kunanen flew into a rave. <laughs> <laughs> saying that Hurley had no right to act all high and mighty because Hurley was dating Hugh Grant at the time, who Great was point. himself going through legal troubles. You know, he just... Ah, he's a <laughs> horny. He could have got Hugh Grant. <laughs> he, like, he, like, that could have been like a legit thing that almost happened. They all were just like... <laughs> at the end of this... <laughs> Furthermore, Kunanen said that he despised Hugh Grant, specifically because Andrew claimed that he had auditioned for the lead in the 1995 rom-com Nine Months. Yes, absolutely. He yeah. definitely yeah. was in the running. Yeah. You had me at a low. <laughs> the lines. Yeah, hey. Yeah. <laughs> and Hugh Grant had unfairly been given the part over Kunanen. I get it, man. Jim Carrey was Dr. Robotnik. Yeah. yeah. It should have been me. They didn't even call me. Yeah, no. no. I was supposed to be in a movie and Fisher Stevens got the part. I hate him. Really? Yeah. Fisher Stevens beat you out? Beat me out? Yeah, it's happened. It's a Tom Cruise movie. Oh, my God. Oh, shit. <laughs> Jesus, no. <laughs> what was the movie? Oh, the one with him and Cameron Diaz. I don't remember the name of it. Oh, I don't it know It was either. supposed to be a computer hacker. Oh, okay. Yeah, you were supposed to be a computer hacker? No, no, no. I didn't have my knuckles. I was so good. <laughs> Look at your fingers. <laughs> you, can't, you can barely use the phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. He's dead to the can. <laughs> but what's interesting here 
is that a bit of a flip happened when it came to Cunanan's attitude towards celebrities. Whereas before he would sing the praises of celebrities like Gianni Versace, he was now saying that he hated Versace and his pretentious, pompous, ostentatious design. I hate your flip flops. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine screaming that in real, like real rage at someone? I hate your flip flops. <laughs> How dare you? You've got little lions on them. I hate them. Well, subsequently. Andrew Cunanan began making an enemies list like he was fucking Richard Nixon. Except this was, it wasn't necessarily an enemies list. It was a hate list. These are people that I hate. This is my bad, bad no-no list (laughs) that I might kill people from. Yeah, never make the list. No. No, no, keep keep it it in your head. Yeah, right up here. Yeah, and if, because if really they're that important, you don't need a list. Yeah. You're not going to forget. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if you're worried about forgetting who you need to kill, you really should think about making a list. If I could just get organized. (laughs) Glad I called that guy. Well, amongst those names was, of course, Gianni Versace. Now, Cunanan took a brief sojourn to Los Angeles in early 1997, where he hung out on the corner of Santa Monica Boulevard and La Brea Avenue dressed as a woman. Who donut it? time. Yeah, that's exactly. That's tangerine. That's, that's where donut time that, is? That's what, and now it's the, the Trejo's Donuts. Yes. Ah. But which, great churro iced coffee, by the way. Sure, it is. But, the, uh, but yeah, no, that's the donut time. I used to work right around there, and I'd walk, and I'd get yelled at and shit. It was fucking fun. What do you get yelled at for? I'm the guy, hey, boy, you like me, you know, kind of a oh, deal. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, you yeah. got... No, that was a famous. That you're like you have to be good. You have to, to get, get that good corner. to get that spot. That's, that's real. Like, that's a real good corner. You have wow. to get that spot. Wow, that's yeah. interesting. The famous donut time. He was there. It's um, unbelievable. He probably knew some of the people in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> Well, at that location, Andrew claimed that he was picked up by a dozen men, including several famous actors, although Cunanan was never more specific about their identities other than to say that one of them was, quote, that old guy who plays the grandpa on that TV show. I believe this, by the way. The studios are right there. Yeah. (laughs) They're right. They're like a walking distance. Yeah. You know, so he could have been picked up multiple times. He doesn't know everyone who's famous. No, No. he He just knows the big guys. You know, he knows Tom Cruise. Cruz and Nicole Kidman. Who is the old guy that plays the grandpa on that TV show? Could have been Mr. Belvedere. (laughs) Whoa. No, he's the butler. He's the butler. No, 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 this is this is 1997. 1997. The old Frasier. The guy from Frasier. It it was not the guy from Frasier. It could have been anyone who played a grandpa. It could have been the Munster's grandpa. Because that's a long time ago. That's super long ago. But he was still alive at this point. Hmm. Yeah, because the guy on Frasier wasn't the grandpa, he was the father. The yeah. guy from Beverly Hills, uh, Be- Beverly Hillbillies? That that's, guy? That's way, he would have been fucking decrepit by that point. He yeah. wasn't going to and the And that was studios. more of a grandma. Yeah, mm, there, yeah <laughs> it was more of a grandma, grandma show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah, Jed Clampett was more of a patriarch. But what if the grandma was dressed as a dude? <laughs> the fuck yeah, man. Man, cool. All right, now it's Fox News. ACDC, whatever that's called. <laughs> But after his L.A. adventure, Andrew Cunanan decided that it was time to leave California altogether. I'm done with it. It, It's not done with me yet. (laughs) You'll see. (laughs) But I'm done with it. His plan was to move to Minnesota to be close to Jeff Trail and David Madsen. And they were so excited about it. Oh, neither one of them wanted him there. Obviously. neither could bear to say that to Andrew's face. Live from your grave. Hey there, dudes and dudettes. Time to wax up your boards and go catch the big wave over at the LPN Beach Beach, Blanket. blanket, blanket, Bingo! bingo. One night only at the Balboa Theater in San Diego, October 20th. Come and check out all of the cool cats and the crazy dogs at LPN. Every show in the entire network, each one pulsating and grinding in front of you for your entertainment pleasure. We're all going to catch the big kahuna. I know I'm talking about that big greasy guy. I'm talking about a wave. Ew, it's seaweed. It's seaweed. Just so you know, it's going to be inside of a theater, so any physical wetness you experience is your own personal body heat or the sweat of one of the performers. For live stream tickets, go to veeps.com slash L-P-O-T-L to watch from the comfort of your own home. Again, that's V-E-E-P-S dot com slash L-P-O-T-L. <laughs> Come and check it out. I'm certain if there's a podcast flavor you need on your tongue, we got the spoon for it. Beach Blanket Bingo, baby. 
Come on, girls, let's dance! Now, in the months leading up to the murder spree, Kunanin began getting more aggressive and manic, although it was somewhat playful, if highly inappropriate at first. Mm. One friend said that one night at the bar, Kunanin kept picking him up and putting him down all night up and down and up and down for seemingly no reason and just maniacally just laughing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well he I mean it was he mess. was just being weird he was being really weird and truly like it's the, the they, he was hurting people yes he should have learned some jokes we you I know, say like, this every day you don't day. have to do that you don't have to pick people up and laugh and like be a freak you yeah. know you could just tell some jokes and everyone's happy but his, his jokes are just gonna be je- they're gonna make you just as uncomfortable do you know no, what no. it's like to watch a man's asshole get spread apart by a bunch of hooks what is it like nice <laughs> Sorry, you were looking for a punchline. <laughs> but soon that inappropriate playfulness turned to violent aggression masked as so-called affection. As one friend put it, Kunanin grabbed him by the neck and choked him, almost as if Andrew was beginning to test how far he could go with violence outside of an SM setting. Have you ever had that with somebody that starts getting fucked up? And like they do that thing where they're gra- they're grabbing at you. Like I've had that. Yeah. I mean, because I'm a little guy. Yeah. So it's like I've had that happen to me often where someone's like grabbing at you and shit like He's scared. I mean, Andrew Gunan, he scares the shit out of me. All the time, man. Being a big dude at a bar, people love to, like, just grab you and wrestle you and, like, literally jump on your back and shit. And so you got to, like, fucking just throw them off occasionally. Yeah. It's weird. People test you when you're large. But that's fine. See, I've got the nice middle ground because, yeah, yeah, sometimes people do get aggressive, but it's only when we're right at each other, right at each other's faces. But I've got that nice middle ground where you don't know what I'm going to do. Yeah, Yeah, you look like an Andrew Cunanan. Yeah, Yeah. I look like somebody that, like, it's like, you're going to, I might look lose but you're gonna, gonna lose yeah, an ear exactly you're gonna shank someone with a pencil yeah yeah <laughs> that's why i just show them my c4 fest yeah. i mean like i just show them like see i'm strapped with explosives it's how, it's how that one time at second chance when those two dudes were fucking with you when you had the hernia and that's i just right. and i fucking got up and, I, and they backed off and then they were trying to fight me yeah they were trying to fight you and you were weakened because your dick balloon had popped through your gut holes oh <laughs> man i miss seeing my intestines and my balls we all do <laughs> Well, around the same time, Kunanin's aggressive behavior graduated to the felony level when he briefly returned to San Francisco. There, he met a man who was the assistant manager of a gay club called Denny's. Ooh, that's, oh. a, that's a mix up there. <laughs> Waiting to happen. Now the I moods know. over my hammy. Yeah. That, that, that I, I, was about, is... I was about to fight. I almost wrote in, and I don't want to hear a single fucking <laughs> moons over my hammy joke from either one of you motherfuckers, because I know it's coming. Well, he had to go to Miami to kill Versace. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. That's good. I'll take that one. I'll take that one. Well, according to this manager... Kunanen tried selling him ecstasy and cocaine, all while he bragged about knowing Elizabeth Hurley, Lisa Kudrow, and they just fucking threw Madonna into the mix. Yeah, she's a bitch. No, she would say, like, <laughs> Madonna could be a bit much. You what? could be, you know what, honestly, and he's sitting there, like, heads kind of half bleeding, shame, <laughs> covered with, like, cake icing is all of it. He's got a whip in his hand. Yeah. You know, Madonna can be a lot. <laughs> it's the cone breast that turned me off. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just like, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> but later that night, this man said that he was with Kunanen in a hotel room when he began to realize that his drink had been drugged. He passed out and briefly regained consciousness, only to find Andrew reaching for his throat. This guy tried fighting Andrew off, but finally passed out completely and awoke, in his words, believing that he'd been raped. Andrew, of course, was nowhere to be found. Now, this increasingly violent and reckless behavior points towards the possibility that Andrew had already decided that his life was coming to an end soon. In addition to his crimes, Andrew amassed $40,000 $40,000 in credit card debt in a matter of weeks. And he even, he managed to get American Express on the phone to beg for just a little bit more money. He did have the power of, he did have a little bit of that power of cheer, like I push you and I'll push you and push you until you agree with me. He had yeah. like negotiating tactics in a way that was like, he, you know, again, he was also just a very scary. And then these are just people on the phone. And they're yeah. like, all right, fine, okay, fine, fine. Um, he also started giving his stuff away. Yeah. That was the other thing. Yeah. So giving away all, all of his thing. fancy stuff, any piece all of Tom Cruise dolls. <laughs> you're gonna want this one. You're gonna really want this one, right? Because this is from this is from cocktail. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be worth a lot of money. It's in the box. <laughs> that loan, of course, that he begged American Express for, that extension, was for a plane ticket back to Minneapolis. See, by this point, Andrew, of course, was still doing a lot of meth. And in his meth-fueled paranoia, he'd become convinced that his friends Jeff Trail and David Madsen were lovers. 
In fact, Andrew actually called Jeff Trail to confront him about his suspicions. But after Jeff denied that anything was going on, Kunanen ended the conversation by screaming, I'm going to kill you, Jeffrey Trail! You're dead! got to be more subtle than that. That's the thing. <laughs> it does seem like a bit on the nose. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because Vulgar Favors also kind of breaks down a little bit more of this. This is all entirely in his head. Yeah, Kunanans. Jeff Trail was the guy that he was, you know, the, sh- the all-American boy that was still in the closet that did not know, like, you know, he was a soldier. He had a lot of other things that caused him to sort of, like, leave the the area where he was with Andrew Cunanan. He was trying to live, like, a, a simpler life, essentially, and trying to figure out, like, and so he didn't understand. He always thought him and Andrew were just friends. Like, they never really crossed the the Rubicon of, of sexual Congress. Well, he knew that Andrew Cunanan wanted him. Yes. Like, because Cunanan was constantly pressuring him for it. But, like, Jeff Trail truly was one of those, like, he's, like, most gay dudes. He's just some born ass dude. Yes, That's just like, a no- truly normal guy. Just truly normal, born dude. And Too same nice with the, for his own good. To, exactly. Very and, much so. And David Madsen also was just a normal guy. And he had had other, but he had, at this time, he had another boyfriend. Like, the, he had two guys in a row. Like, he, he had, like, normal boyfriends. Like, literally just normal relationships. And he kept trying to explain to him. He's like, number one, Andrew, I have, I don't know, I don't, you know, me and Jeff are not together. We're friends. Because they're in Minneapolis. And a place like this, you know, the the gay community sticks together. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Because it is a really intense place to be gay and out gay, especially at this time period still. Right. Even though there's a lot more awareness and people are trying to kind of be cooler about it. It's still like very difficult. It's you are still a a, a, a suppressed person. Is that where Dahmer was? Uh, he was in Milwaukee. Okay, Milwaukee. Okay. No. Yeah, this, uh, and this is, yeah, this is 1997. It's like people are barely becoming okay with like will and grace. Yeah. You know? Yes. And it was a big deal to be outed. Right. You know, like all of these types of things. And so they're all kind of, they do know each other in a circle, but Andrew's like, but David Madsen was just like, listen, like we're all just kind of tangential friend. We're all just like, we're hanging out, like chill out, literally chill the fuck out. Yeah. Jeff Trail had like a regular monogamous boyfriend just hanging out. Everyone's just fucking hanging out, being normal people. But with the death threat, it seems like Jeff Trail took Kunanen only half seriously. He was concerned for himself, yes, but he was also concerned for Kunanen's mental state because Jeff Trail was a good dude who actually cared about people. He just happened to make the wrong friend. But soon after the threatening call, Andrew Kunanen attended a dinner party at a restaurant called California Cuisine. Never go to a, a restaurant in another city named after another state because <laughs> it's never correct. Yeah. No, no, no. This was in California. Oh, this okay. In, oh, this, oh, was oh, in, oh, okay. this was in San Diego. Okay, okay. Yeah, I thought yeah, I was yeah. just like, never go to California cuisine in Minneapolis. <laughs> How is California Pizza Kitchen a viable business? I don't it's, know. I don't know. California has the worst pizza in the world. We, it, that is real. That is, I, I guarantee. Yes. They, they've been living off of this. I have no idea. <laughs> it makes no sense. It's one of those. It's, I think it's just the... It's it's a front. <laughs> They're running money to somebody. I'm looking at Mitch McConnell. <laughs> well, Kunanen ordered the ostrich. Sure. And told a friend that he was going to, quote, take care of some business in Minnesota. And on April 26, 1997, Andrew did just that. You always do. I always have business in Minnesota. Yeah. I always got to go. That you got to go take care of. Don't you worry, Marcus. <laughs> I'm going to take care of it right away. Yeah. I love the, when my friends tell me vague plans <laughs> that they have to go take care of something six states away. Yeah. I bought a one-way ticket to go take care of some business. <laughs> I have to kill a man in Wyoming. Don't tell <laughs> me. Ah, shit. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> now, even though Kunanen had explicitly threatened to kill Jeff Trail, David Madsen still picked him up at the airport, telling his friends that he felt like Kunanen was in a bad place and needed some help. Uh, help us. Yes. Trail and Madsen also didn't realize that Andrew Kunanen was a different person to everyone he knew. They only knew the Andrew that he wanted them to see. And even though they were getting a little tired of dealing with Andrew's shit, they were convinced that they could help him through his substance abuse problems and mental health issues. This, unfortunately, would be to the great detriment of both Jeff Trail and David Matson. Now, Andrew Kunanen was staying at David Matson's place when he arrived in Minneapolis in late April. But while David was out of the house, Kunanen called Jeff Trail and asked him to come over, ostensibly so they could talk things through. Yeah, they were. They, it, it's really interesting. Uh, in my mind, I don't know how much of this was a setup or not. Uh, I know that he stayed at David Madsen's place 
because he had nowhere else to go. Yeah. And the man allowed him to. He had no more money. He had no, he was, he had no, he couldn't stay at a hotel. He had burned every fucking bridge that he possibly had. Most people were kind of creeped out by him. Yeah. Well, Jeff Trail soon realized upon his arrival, though, that he was only going to be interacting with an irate Andrew Cunanan. According to a neighbor, a person began shouting, get the fuck out, around 10 p.m. And for about a minute, the neighbor heard more shouting and a series of thuds before everything suddenly went silent. You sit there in bed hearing that, get the fuck out, Baba, please do bum, Baba, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> Right back to sleep. Thank God that's over. <laughs> Actually, that is what, what what the neighbor said. Oh, yeah. They're yeah. like, well, seems like everything resolved itself. Well, you know what? It's a lot, too. They all, this is a part of where, this is where the homophobia comes in. Yes. Everybody talks about I me mean, like, that must be some wild gay sex happening in there. And yeah. it's like, man, again, mostly it is just, <laughs> thank you. And then it, or it's silent. Yeah. It's the same noises that we make doing during sex, but double. <laughs> oh, yeah. See, Matson had been in the middle of renovating his kitchen, so tools were lying about in all sorts of convenient positions. From what forensics could surmise, Kunanin grabbed a claw hammer, swung it at Jeff, and missed, creating a dent in the wall. Another neighbor claims that they heard running, and Jeff did indeed make a break for it. But from the blood spatter found outside the apartment in the hallway and the brain matter found in the doorframe, Andrew quickly caught up. It was a scene from a horror movie. Yeah. But even so, Jeff held on for a little while longer, enough for there to be multiple defensive wounds on his arms from the hammer blows. But eventually, the attack became too fierce, and Andrew Cunanan finished off his friend with 27 hammer blows to the head. Now, if you'll remember, this was not Jeff Trail's or Andrew Cunanan's apartment. This was David Madsen's apartment, and he came home soon after the murder to find that one of his friends had killed another of his friends with a claw hammer. Now, this is one of those true crime questions that has been bandied about by many different people. What was the situation in that apartment after this crime? And because it's impossible to know. It's impossible to know because uh, we know that the there were conjecture obviously put into the, the show, the yeah. show that came out where it's like they played out a drama scene, which kind of makes sense. But there's, there's a bunch of different views here about what happened next, but we can never know because n- neither one of them got to tell the story. Yeah. Before yeah. they were both dead. I mean, who knows what decision you're going to make when you see a dead body in your apartment? Yes. You know, that's just like something that happens. Well, I know I, I know you should call the police. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, would call would the police. Someone's swinging a hammer around? <laughs> well, <laughs> just, uh, truly, I still feel like the main thing at all times is what, I, what we talked about. Like, be a, it's always be a man and run away. Like, you <laughs> see that shit coming, you just book it. You just get the fuck away from the guy. You get as far away as humanly possible, and you call the police as soon as you can. You could have gone. He probably went into fucking shock. Yeah. Yeah, sure. No, I'm not saying what you should, like, he should have done. It's just more like, that was what I would say. If you can put yourself in the situation, just make sure you literally run away. Well, we'll get into here in a second as to why that may not have been an option. Of course. Now, author Maureen Orth strongly hints that David Madsen may have been involved in the murder or soon became an accomplice after discovering a murder had taken place. But I'm more inclined to agree with David Madsen's family, if only because Maureen Orth always goes for the most salacious option. Yes. Madsen's family believed that for the next five days, David was effectively Andrew Cunanan's hostage. I believe that is. I I am in that realm as well. Very much so. I think that he came in, Andrew's covered in blood. There is a corpse on the floor or he has already rolled him up in the carpet. Right. Because we know that he did that. Uh, I think that they uh, he Andrew first thing he says is like, you want to see you want to see who they blame first because whose name is on the lease. Like literally yeah. like yeah. it's this is your apartment, buddy. You know, like, yeah. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. David went crazy. He's yeah. like, he's like practicing me like, oh, my God, David, he went nuts. You know, like he's uh, probably saying that to him. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Because remember, like Andrew Cunanan is brilliantly manipulative. Like he is like superficially, his intelligence is very shallow, but he knows how to talk to people. He he knows what people want to hear. Well, he knows how to fuck you up. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, he knew how to manipulate people, 100%. He knew what people had to, not necessarily what people wanted to hear, but what people 
needed to hear, oh, what they yeah. had to hear in order for them to get what he wanted them to do. Or, yeah, and just how to fuck you up. Yeah. yeah. And what a normal, kind person sees an atrocity like this. They freeze. Yeah, they freeze and they think they're going to go to prison. Of course. You know, because, I yeah. have these dreams, personally. Oh, yeah, we've you all know? had these dreams. Oh, yeah, yeah of course. And so, yeah. Now, even though Kunanen had learned many things throughout the years, cleaning up a crime scene was not one of them. Mm. Trail's corpse was wrapped in a rug, dragged into the living room, and left behind a sofa. When Kunanen tried cleaning up the blood with paper towels, he only succeeded in smearing the blood on every surface and obviously gave up on the job considering how there were bloody footprints everywhere. The one thing he did not do was work hard. No. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, <laughs> I can never give anything to a murderer, but it actually takes a lot of effort to really clean up your murders. Yeah. It really does. And, and you got to get bounty. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You gotta get seriously. Or bra that, or Brawny. Brawny's good too. Do we have that ad placement? Here? <laughs> <laughs> he did actually try to use he tried to use paper towels yeah, to though. clean up all this. You can't. You gotta use rags. Yeah, yeah you gotta use your picker upper. Ma, yeah. <laughs> fucking bleach. The whole thing. Yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. No, he was Andrew Cunano was extremely lazy. The only thing that he could do was talk. Anything else was beyond him. Well, strangely though. Jeff Trail's corpse was stripped of its clothes and jewelry, which were all put in a plastic garbage bag with the bloody paper towels and the hammer that was left under the table. Seemingly, there had been half of a plan to dispose of Jeff Trail's corpse, but that plan was obviously abandoned. Most likely, Andrew realized that it was just too much hard work to dispose of a body, and he may have even seen body disposal and crime scene cleanup as beneath him. What we do know is that somehow Andrew Cunanan came to be in possession of Jeff Trail's 40 caliber handgun, possibly because Jeff had brought it with him, knowing that Cunanan might be dangerous, or because Jeff might have had it in his car. Because Andrew Cunanan knew that Jeff Trail carried a gun with him everywhere he went. Yes. But either way, this was the weapon that Cunanan most likely used to hold Matson hostage. It also just could have been information. It didn't just be in there. Now you're a party to this. Mm -hmm. You're too connected to this for you to go away. But what's amazing is that for three days, both men stayed in Madsen's apartment with Trail's quickly decomposing corpse. This fact is known because on April 29th, witnesses saw Madsen and Kunanen walking Madsen's dog. Prince. Prince? That was the name of the dog? P-R-I-N-T-S. Oh. Oh, and it's yeah, Minneapolis, weird? too. Prince. You know what's funny about that? That's the German spelling of Prince. Whoa, interesting. Yeah. Maybe it might... might hmm questions please <laughs> coincidence <laughs> um i uh, i feel that this is a symptom of narcissism yeah. is that uh, you know again armchair just again entirely subjective show we you know i just my, my call from my little sweaty seat here is that i think that it's a symbol of the uh maybe in a way all this can kind of just go away like you can kind you live in this la la land like yeah. maybe we're like this is, it's surreal. Magical right? I'm certain, thinking. I'm certain it's extremely surreal. Like, especially for David Madsen, who's just like kind of sitting and Andrew's first blaming him and slowly being like, we're going to get out of this. Like yeah. slowly explaining about how we're going to get out of this clean. Don't worry. We're going to, we're going to, it's you and me now. Like, and maybe David Madsen's now you're in so, you're in so much shock that you're kind of letting this other person take over for you're like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I guess things will be okay. And cause you're just kind of, you're trapped. Yeah. But from what a neighbor said, David looked, when they saw him walking the dog, David looked like he'd been crying while Andrew was maniacally gesturing and jabbering like always. I'm just saying I feel that it would have been better <laughs> if Penelope Cruz was in, because Nicole Kidman is one of the worst single tall bitches I've ever seen. I wish she would go far and away. Yeah. 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 Now, Jeff Trail's boyfriend tried reporting Jeff as a missing person on April 27th after Jeff never showed up for their date the night before. And when the boyfriend checked Jeff's apartment, he wasn't there either. Police, of course, refused to do anything because 72 hours had not yet passed. It was and it was also, part, it was very much because they were gay. Yes, they were like, they did the thing. They're like, technically only family can uh, report a person missing. Like, yeah. they, they, they stiff the arm enemies because, like, well, I'm like, that's my boyfriend. You know what I mean? And they're like, yeah, whatever. You guys all got nine of them. You know what I mean? Like that shithead, like, homophobia at the time. Yeah. But when David Madsen uncharacteristically didn't show up for work on April 29th, his co-workers called his building manager, who opened the door to the apartment at 4 p.m. after walking down a hallway streaked with blood. I think he even, like, asked a neighbor to come with him. Yes. Like, he saw the blood and he's like, hey, there's something fucked up. Can you come with me? Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, once inside, they found a pool of dried blood and a body wrapped in a rug, which was reasonably believed to be the body of David Madsen. But little did the building manager know that David and Kunanan were hiding in the bedroom. When the manager left to call the police, Andrew and David escaped down the fire escape and took off in Jeff's Jeep chair. Hold on to my butt. We're like we're Batman and Robin. More like Batman and Robin. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm a multiple murderer. <laughs> now, the investigator who arrived on the scene was a man named Sergeant Bob Tichich. This guy. Going off what the manager knew about David, Sergeant Bob decided immediately that this was probably, quote, a gay thing. He also assumed that the body was David's. And that, honestly, was the first error, right? Obviously, it was an error. They didn't know what to do because they're saying that at the time period, uh, when th this is right after the O.J. Simpson trial, all this type of shit. Said. So the one thing that Vulgar Favors sort of blames his first mistake on is the police now, like, overprotection of evidence. Because the whole thing is that, you know, the a lot of shit got destroyed during the the O.J. Simpson investigation and they blame the police and like, you know, all this kind of evidence got destroyed. So now they kind of use it weirdly as a weapon being like, we don't care what anybody says. We're taking this as we're taking the beginnings of these investigations as long as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't going to unfold the rug. He was also super fucking weirded out because, you know, like you have to if that's not David Madsen, I'd need a search warrant to be in this room. And then all of this goes away. Everything in this room goes away legally. I can't cover this. And so they called it David Madsen, but that's what allowed them to get away. That's yeah. what allowed them to get going as fast, like get the jump on police. But as they began looking around the apartment, they began seeing signs pointing towards a man named Andrew Kunanen. Inside a gym bag with Kunanin's name on it, they found the world's worst go bag <laughs> containing <laughs> porn, steroids, hand and leg cuffs, lube, and an empty gun holster. It's the empty gun holster. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because you're like, are you using lube on the gun? You I mean, like, they don't even understand. That's yeah. an I'm a go bag. Like, now, <laughs> I'm a go move. <laughs> because for a while they thought they don't know why he had these like he had these like super high end steroids on him and it just seemed like it was another he, there's a lot of conjecture about what he did for money Andrew yeah. Cunanan because it's all like you know obviously there's sex work and the, but it seems like he was really into drugs across the board and well, he was selling drugs when you take steroids and you don't work out you get fat and angry they yeah. said there was none in the system they oh, said there was none in the system it was okay. not that it, it, because that was guessed that they happened thought, to my buddy he started mm -hmm. taking steroids it didn't work out he just got all fat and angry yeah. and we <laughs> stopped hanging out with him that's a South Park episode <laughs> <laughs> but once the body was determined to be not David Madsen's, but Jeff Trails, Madsen became the main suspect. Although there was a message on Trails' answering machine from Kunanen inviting Trail to Madsen's apartment. That message, however, only fed into the narrative that Kunanen, Trail, and Madsen had been involved in a love triangle that had resulted in the murder of one of the participants. Yeah, and that just went all over the news. Yeah, it's just, I mean, because it, it just comes back to this narrative that the police had that, that they just put out at all points was these gays are crazy. They crazy. Yeah. But Jeff had a separate relationship, right? Jeff had a boyfriend. He yeah. had a normal boyfriend outside, well, I, well, who, had had reported, had boyfriend. who had already yeah. tried reporting it to the police. So yeah. that's a, it's a love square. Yeah, and it's a love school. Amongst two other, you know, it's just two other points in other geological locations. They are not connected. <laughs> There's no love. There's just like a couple of guys with boyfriends and their fucking psycho friends. Yeah, who killed yeah. everybody. Yeah. He technically was the one who brought them all together. Yeah. And Interesting. Isn't, and isn't mm -hmm. that the tragedy? Isn't that? Well, the going theory that Sergeant Bob was working with was that Madsen was a steroid user who flew into a rage and killed Jeff Trail, which was the theory that he shared with Trail's parents, who had no idea that Trail was gay. Yeah, he was. They, they, his lack of bedside manner was noted many, many times. Yes. Madsen, Sergeant Bob surmised, might have then ran off with this mysterious third fellow named Andrew Kunanen. Now, David and Andrew either took their time getting out of Minneapolis or were moving slowly and carefully, although their behavior points towards the former, if you believe witnesses. According to reports, they were spotted on May 2nd at a bar in the town of Spark wearing khaki shorts and flirty open shirts. God, this is so, it's like everybody's all with the flirty and the, <laughs> something like it just shirts. But as Andrew and David drove on I-35 towards Duluth, something changed, although it's impossible to know what. 
maybe David Madsen said, I can't do this anymore. Uh, I bet. Yeah. He's like, let's just call the police. Yeah. Let's just do this. Let's this wrap has this up. Out of hand. This is getting crazy. Why are we running? Because I think for a while, Andrew Kananen was morbidly curious about what his fate was going to be as that he sat and then he was watching kind of the news play out. And then he was starting to get that old funny feeling mm -hmm. where he was like, oh, is this attention? Yeah. And he's starting to be like, oh, my name is like in the news. And you can kind of feel like a little like, because I feel like, because they talk about with serial killers, they would often go back to the scene of the crime to relive what's going on. I think the hesitancy to leave was being like, let's kind of see how this plays out a little bit. Yeah. Let's see the local news. And also Duluth is a charming town. Is it? Yeah. It's got a nice bridge. Horrible zoo. But the, <laughs> but the, but the, uh, but the yeah, I don't want to see a Duluth zebra. <laughs> <laughs> what we all we know for sure is that Kunanen pulled off the road about 45 miles north of Minneapolis, where he and Madsen got out of the Jeep near East Rush Lake. Madsen was walking in front of Kunanen when Andrew took Jeff Trail's pistol and shot Madsen in the back. Madsen fell to his hands, at which point Kunanen walked in front of him. As Madsen looked up, Kunanen aimed the pistol and shot Matson in the eye, killing him instantly. Kunanen then shot him once more in the face, dragged his body 20 feet away, then got back in the car and drove off. By the time Matson's body was found 18 hours later, Kunanen was already on his way to Illinois. Man, there was a witness, the witness that found the body was like a guy that was a fisherman over there. And the his first sentiment in the book, Vulgar Favors, was just like, it's like, you know, I don't know what it is about dropping bodies by the water. Something like spiritual, I guess, or something. But they're always finding them there. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just like, Jesus That's such Christ. a fucking Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whatever. They're always at right there. You know what I mean? Like, why is that, though? You know what I mean? My kids are there. But at the same time, I get it. It's nice. <laughs> Live from your grave. Now, Chisago County Police immediately publicized everything they knew about the case, including the bullet casings they found at the murder scene that were of the 40 caliber Golden Sabre variety. This, of course, caught the attention of Sergeant Bob, who knew that the same type of bullets had been used in his murder case. So he called up the Chis... <laughs> this word is so... Chisago. Chisago. Chisago is very difficult to say. Yeah, because you want to say Chicago. But yeah, of yeah. course. It's yeah. Chis Chisago. Chisago. Or what it is be, that? Uh, it's the county in which uh, the All David Madsen murder occurred. Oh, okay. yeah. So sh it's either Chisago. Chisa it might or be Chis Chisago. It might be. I don't know. It's it might like, be Chisago. I'm going to look it up right now. Yeah. <laughs> Look it up right fucking now. No, not how to pronounce Ch Chicago. I'm no, not. A they're not going to let you know. They're not going to go to Chicago. Why are you? No, I'm not going to. I don't want to pronounce Chicago. I know. Yeah, I actually in the, in uh, writing this, I realized that someone could pronounce Chicago as Chicago. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So here we here go. Wait. let's start doing that. <laughs> here, here, here. <laughs> yeah, Chicago. Yeah, it's like Kunanan. Yeah. <laughs> here we go. I got this. Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. So we were wrong on every point. Every it's got point. like a T in front of it, like a silent. Yeah, yeah. Chicago, Chicago, Chicago with a uh, like a sha, okay. like Chicago, but Chicago. Oh, fuck. fuck, God, we've ground to a halt. God, the English language. Why are Why are we doing this? Actually, I actually think that might be Native American. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So. This sheriff called up the Chicago Police Department and helped identify David Matson's body. Soon after, a call was put out for Matson's Jeep Cherokee, which was most likely now being driven by Andrew Cunanan, as far as the police were concerned. Now, once it became clear that Cunanan was the main suspect in the Chicago County murder, Sheriff Randy Schwegman traveled to San Diego oh, to Lord. check out Cunanan's apartment, where he soon found himself completely out of his element. Ah, oh, well, now this seems to be a big different scene for me. <laughs> I just don't know. I see that man's pubic hair. <laughs> I feel uh, like well, this is a bunch of risky business. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather be going Tom Cruise. <laughs> well, in addition to the bizarre Tom Cruise shine, which may or may not have existed, Schwegman also found an incredible amount of S&M gear. Oh, I wish these, these boys would be nicer to each other. I, <laughs> I can't believe this. Oh, Oh, wow. <laughs> and a stack of brutal VHS porn tapes, oh. some involving sex with animals. Please, just, oh, you should be petting them. Not that way, though. I, oh, you should just be riding them, but not that way, though. Oh, do we got to watch all of them? <laughs> Can we, do we have the gist of it? Honestly, 
I'm starting to get into it. <laughs> he also found photos of Kunanan himself wearing a range of expressions and hairstyles. You know, he really could have been an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Schwegman then went through Andrew's fashionable wardrobe, although Schwegman admitted that he was not a fashionista. In some fact, kind of jacket, whatever this is, you can <laughs> see your nipples through this. <laughs> In fact, Schwegman later said, and this is a direct quote, I'm not into fashion, but I knew that these were clothes. <laughs> That's like saying, I'm not into beef, but I know these are burgers. <laughs> but the most important detail was in Andrew Cunanan's diary. In an entry written just before Cunanan went to Minneapolis, Andrew wrote that if he needed to get lost, he'd do it in New York City. Because you could be anybody there. <laughs> Anything you want. I love. Yeah, he loves New York, man. And so police in the Northeast were alerted. And for good measure, Sheriff Schwegman passed on to higher authorities that someone should probably let Tom Cruise know that there's a nut job on the loose. <laughs> Meanwhile, like him above is like nine Scientology slaves, like <laughs> them like practicing for the Christmas party that year. And stuff being like, I think everything's going to be okay, Jack. Ha ha. Ha ha. Well, for me, that implies that the Tom Cruise shrine was real. Well, at least that. He, something was there was a lot of Tom Cruise in this studio apartment there's a yeah. lot of memorabilia in there and then it's just like you see the Tom Cruise posters and just like all these guys just fucking crying you know <laughs> that, that you're supposed to jerk off to it and, and so I think it's very I think it's a lot for the man to take yeah now the authorities were of course pretty confident that they would pick up Kunan in, in short order but that's because they didn't know who they were dealing with. A federal fugitive warrant was issued and they surveilled Kunan in San Diego apartment because Sheriff Schwegman was convinced Andrew was going to return. But the trail soon went cold and nobody knew where to even start looking for Andrew Kunan. As it turned out, Andrew was headed straight to Chicago where he would cross paths with a 72-year-old real estate developer named Lee Miglin. Now, to dispel any assumptions, Miglin was not a sugar daddy, even though the show very much portrays him as a sugar daddy. Yeah, for do. yeah, for drama's sake, yeah, it, it does make sense. But you it's know, a better story if he's a sugar daddy. But he's a real person. Yeah, <laughs> it's just <laughs> called it's called portrayals, and the guy the. Uh, the people that wrote the book in the vulgar favors, they talk. There's like a 30 minute, like 30 page, like search where they talk about how they try to dig in to try to find out if he was a sugar daddy for a long time. And there was no direct evidence that pointed towards him doing yeah. anything like that. Well, he'd led an interesting life. He was a known person. He designed several of Chicago's skyscrapers, and he'd married a nightclub chorus girl named Marilyn, who herself operated a successful cosmetics and perfume company that sold their products on the Home Shopping Network. In the TV, in the, uh, TV show, she was played by the woman who played the mom and who's the boss. She won. Yes. She, I think she got nominated for an Emmy. She's great in it. She's that. incredible in she it. She did a really wonderful job. Yeah. Well, reportedly, the TV sales alone on Marilyn Miglin's makeup company earned $6 million a year. And Marilyn came to be known as the queen of makeovers. Ooh. But when Andrew Cunanan rolled into Chicago, Marilyn Miglin was in Toronto on a business trip. Now, as far as why Cunanan went to Chicago, it's speculated that he knew a rich family there and had spent a fair amount of time in the city. But even though he was on the run, Cunanan was still going to gay bars every night and he was sleeping in David Madsen's Cherokee. There was a term that a guy said, I forget what it was. It's like, the, I think he said cocooning. He's like, there's a thing that you can do because if you go to the bathhouses, right, like you for the for these various places, he's like, you basically stay at the bar till it closes. And then you go to the bathhouses and you you shower and do whatever. You could stay there all day. He's like, he's seen it happen before. You watch a guy kind of roll into town and then he's kind of living for free. He's staying all day, you yeah. know, like hanging out, like eating all the free stuff, anything that's free. He's obviously got nowhere to go. He, it seems probably that he's homeless, but he managed to get some kind of amount of money to stay in these various places. Um, I think that he went to Chicago because he started one of his lies back in the day was him saying, I have a business investment company mm. in Chicago. And, right. start, and this is where you wonder, like, is are his lies real, right? Is he saying truths that then are, that this shows to be real? Or does Andrew Cunanan have an instinctual understanding that someone is going to tell his story after all of this is over? And this completes one of my lies. I right. go to Chicago. It 
fulfills one of the things I told somebody is that I knew this old sugar daddy in the Chicago area that takes care of me, blah, blah, blah. And then with it done is then, then everyone will be like, oh, yeah, he knew just to kind of flesh out his own like expose later on down the line. Yeah. And he also knew people in Chicago. He had gone to Chicago multiple yeah, times. Yeah, he, he, he knew he, people. He, in he knew people. He knows people everywhere. Yeah, he does. Now, obviously, Kunana was going to run out of cash and his credit cards were all maxed out. And it's believed that this is why Kunanen drove out to the wealthy Gold Coast district of Chicago to visit the Miglin home. Now, there's a lot of speculation as to why Kunanen went to the Miglin home. But the most likely rumor was that Miglin's son, Duke, was an actor in L.A. who knew Kunanen. And that was how Kunanen found Miglin's house and talked his way into the home. Because we know he got in. He didn't break in. No, he didn't. Uh, but we, uh, there's also a lot of evidence that points to the fact that he might have been casing the house. Maybe. Um, there is some of that. I feel like they waited for the, someone to go away. I think that he knew that the the wife was going to leave for the weekend because she left her to go on a business trip. And he, there because there there is that saying that the car, the, that 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 car, like the, the he was driving, was seen several times in the neighborhood casing. Um, and then maybe he did know. Maybe that's what it was. He was waiting for to see if Lee would end up alone. And then he could talk his way into the house being like, I know your son, Duke. Yeah. And it's also and it, but it also begs the question as to, you know, how did Andrew Kunal like if he's just friends with this guy, Duke, like how many people like friends do you have that you casually mention your parents street address or which is weird. If he looks it up, Lee Miglin was famous. So yeah, he finds yeah. out where he lives. Yep. And then maybe what he does, there's also the, the contention because they talked about how Lee Miglin was working outside all day. Yeah. He was going in and out. He had a project in his garage. He was going in and out from the garage back to the house. And so is this another scenario where he rolled up and he saw him and then he flashes the gun and he holds to be like, this is a robbery, right? Maybe it's like that too. Maybe there's that thing where it starts the whole thing as a robbery because Lee Miglin knew that he was just going to give up because that's the advice, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you just let them take whatever they're going to fucking take. Yeah. Also, it's the 90s. Every phone booth has a phone book in it. Yeah, yeah. I guess you, you just could look, look up it someone's up. address. Yeah. yeah. Now, the more salacious reasoning behind Kunanen's arrival at the Miglin home was rumors that Miglin was bisexual. A nurse who hosted an AIDS education support group claimed to have heard Lee Miglin's name several times during sessions. But it seems more likely that this woman was just another vulture trying to insert herself into the story. Who knows? Yeah, anyone who... Why would any? Why would she say that? Like, yeah, even if it's I mean, true, like, who gives a shit? The, the, <laughs> vulgar <laughs> favors, that is where it gets, yeah. like, deep into, the, like, the, the, the very intense, salacious end of this whole thing. Because it's, it's picking up anybody... Because he was a famous man in Chicago. Yeah. You know, like he was a well-known entity. It seems like... An Abe Froman type. Yes. <laughs> and see, truly. And then seeing, talking about him, I think that you just... When people know you, you're just a collection of projections to everybody. So it's like, it's that thing where you, they just say that name. They just say, who knows? Who fucking knows? Yeah, who, who knows if they actually said the name I don't or know. not? Or if he, this woman just decided that she wanted to be a part of the story and just made some shit up. All I know is, is that they, they, they do document in Vulgar Favors the search to see if any of this was real. And they could not find a single person that could actually, like, put him with another dude in a room together. Yeah. Now, what went on between Lee Miglin and Andrew Kunanen is a total mystery. Yeah. We don't know whether Kunanen was invited inside or forced his way in using his pistol, but Lee Miglin definitely answered the door when Kunanen rang the doorbell. Again, it's impossible to know the chain of events here, but at some point, Kunanen either forced Miglin into the garage at gunpoint or made up a reason for Miglin to take him to the garage because it was obvious that Kunanen needed to get rid of David Madsen's Jeep. But once they were in the garage the torture of Lee Miglin began. Kunanen shoved a white garden glove in Miglin's mouth, then bound Miglin's face completely in masking tape, cutting a hole right around Miglin's nose so he could breathe. His ankles were also bound with an extension cord, possibly to add a bit of S&M to the mix, because it's at this point that Andrew undressed Lee Miglin before truly launching into a quick but brutal murder. After slamming his fist down onto Miglin's chest over and over again, Kunanen took a screwdriver and stabbed it into Miglin's chest 20 times. It's here that Andrew Kunanen began experimenting. It's almost as if he's trying on the role of the serial killer. That's how it feels. Taking a pruning saw, Andrew vigorously sawed into Miglin's throat, slashing blood all over the garage. The gash was seven inches long and wound from the back of Miglin's neck to his throat, almost decapitated him. 
Cunanan then redressed Miglin and ended the mutilation of the corpse by placing two bags of cement on Miglin's chest, fracturing all of his ribs. The body was then either pushed under one of Miglin's cars or pushed to the side of the car behind a trash can, depending on the source. But perhaps learning from the murder of Jeff Trail, Cunanan then covered the body in plastic garbage bags, placed some brown paper on top of those, and draped it with a small rug. And after that, Cunanan simply made himself at home. You know, this is where there's there's several different lines of conjecture here where like they always say like, well, he obviously knew the home because he made a sandwich and he shaved and showered. I can and make a sandwich anywhere. This is I, what I'm saying. That's, that's what I'm saying. Like, I could go into any fucking house in the world. It's just and, ma- and manage to make myself a sandwich and fucking shape. Except unless it's like the fucking Winchester mystery house. Yeah, yeah, I think that you can make your way around a house. It's easy to make yourself at home. It's called taking your pants off. Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole business called Airbnb. Yeah, you where just we go, go to someone's home and we use it like it's our own. I don't walk around and have like a post-it being like, this is where the water comes out. It's called a faucet. <laughs> have you heard of a bathroom? Like, no, it's just a house. Now, considering what Andrew did next, we can assume that Miglin and Cunanan had a friendly conversation before the attack because Andrew obviously knew that Miglin's wife would not be returning that night. My pushback, though, is, is that what if he didn't give a shit and if you came in the house, he would shoot you in the fucking head? It's also a possibility. And yeah. then maybe he also, but I also think, I think he cased it. But I think he might have cased it. He was, but at any rate, he was way too comfortable and he was being way too comfy and vulnerable for him to think that maybe this woman might come home tonight. Unless he just realized I'm kind of used to living with corpses now. Was she on TV that night? No, she was in Toronto on a she business was in trip. Toronto. Yeah. yeah. Well, after killing Miglin, Cunanan took a big slab of ham on the bone out of the fridge and carried it to Miglin's study. I'm trying not to like this. <laughs> no, this is the only thing that is relatable. <laughs> there, he sliced off a piece with a big knife, made himself a sandwich, and stabbed the knife back into the ham. But a drama queen. I know. He then went to Miglin's bedroom, watched TV, and fell asleep in Miglin's bed, presumably unbothered by what he'd just done. The next morning, Cunanan showered and shaved, then took one of Miglin's leather jackets, a wristwatch, 10 gold coins, and $10,000 in cash. He then hopped in Miglin's Lexus and headed east towards New York. Yeah, and that's where, well then, you know, it depends on whether or not how hidden those items were. Yeah. Unless they were just out, which is also just straight up you going to... um. You're just literally just ripping through somebody's house and taking yeah. whatever it is. Like you're in the study, so you're probably just looking as far far as you could. So yeah. he slept before he showered. What a what a dirty asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, actually, he did sleep before he showered. Yeah, well, he oh, well he's already. I mean, you know. Yeah. I don't think he cares a lot. He's no. covered in blood. Yep. Now Marilyn Miglin arrived home soon after Kunan and left, annoyed that her husband hadn't picked her up from the airport. But she soon realized that something was terribly wrong, because while Lee was a neat, almost fastidious person, the house was a fucking mess. In addition, their green Lexus was gone. Yeah, he had the house clean every day. Yeah. Marilyn soon fetched a neighbor and called the cops. But while they waited, they tried calling the car phone in the Lexus. The first message stated that the number was unavailable. But when they tried again, they heard an automated response saying the number they were trying to reach was now out of state. He was long gone. But police pretty quickly found Lee Meglin's body behind the other car and discovered that Cunanan had left behind a bizarre crime scene. Now, Andrew had cleaned up a lot of the blood for some reason, which was obvious to police that something horrible had happened and that somebody had cleaned up because Meglin's body had been horrifically mutilated. But when police lifted the body, they found there just was weird shit all over the room. They found a small amount of hydrocortisone cream beneath his body. Yeah, I, it is really strange. I don't know what the hell that is. Yeah. Additionally, Andrew had left some gay porn mags nearby and Meglin's jean zipper was open, although some of the zipper teeth were missing from where Andrew had like roughly undressed the corpse. You know what seems to be, again, Andrew Cunanan at this point knows he's being covered by the media. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he loves it. I think that's that's part of this is that he loves this story is happening. He loves the fact that he's finally getting this attention. I think that this was a big old 
old fashioned serial killer message to the world. Yeah. I think the part of this was to sort of muddy the waters being like, maybe he was my sugar daddy. Yeah. Maybe he was, but you know, like, and pull in more like basically cause at the time, you know, it was considered to be, he was like disrespecting the corpse. Yeah. You know, in many ways. And I think he also was sort of trying on the serial killer thing a little bit more uh, with the gay porn mags. Trying to communicate with the police. No, I think he was trying to masturbate over the corpse and it wasn't quite working. So he brought in some gay porn mags to try to help him along and it still didn't quite work. There's something, there's a, I do think that there's a public humiliation edge. Yeah. To the the Lee Miglin murder. There was something about trashing this man. uh, And that's the reason why they thought there was a personal edge. Por qué no los dos? I don't know. If there was no other gay porn in the house, yeah. then he must have brought it. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. you don't just have three magazines. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah, what are we? What is this? <laughs> He's very wealthy. <laughs> yeah, he'd have a man in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, additionally, they found one of Miglin's shoes in the trunk of his Lexus, leading police to assume that at one point, the murderer had tried putting the body in the trunk but failed, or the murderer had changed their mind after forcing Meglin inside and brought him back out again. I think he wanted the shoes because mm. they were like super expensive shoes. But he just took one of them. I, something happened. It's really strange. Again, I don't think he was thinking clearly. Well, the other shoe was on the foot. Yeah, on it was the, on the body. But when you consider the fact that there were high levels of carbon monoxide found in Miglin's blood and the fact that Miglin had no defensive wounds, it's possible that Kunanen forced Miglin into the trunk at gunpoint and used carbon monoxide to make Miglin pass out. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you think he could have killed him that way and then just no, mutilated his no, body? No, if he wasn't killed, they knew that he was killed from his stab the wounds. wounds. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he then committed every other atrocity while Miglin was already half dead. Now, because of the gay porn and the fact that Miglin was found wearing race, quote, this is what the fucking you know, vulgar favor says, racy bikini underwear. They were just a designer that they were given to him by his wife. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it sounds like some Armani, like, you know, yeah, fancy le- leopard print, fancy yeah. underwear. My father wore a, a banana hammock. For forever. Yeah, my father also wore bikini briefs. Yeah. Yeah, they, they loved him for some reason. I, I, don't know. I think it was a 90s thing. It was something. I yeah. don't know. I don't understand. I think it's a weird flex. Just like, I don't give a shit. Here's yeah. my little briefs. Yeah, yeah, yeah just like yeah. a little tiny. Yeah, but it just, I feel like it's, unless you're huge, it just makes your dick and balls look small. It's always the weird little greasy guys. I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> that happened. I think you're like five years away from doing it yourself. Yeah, well, wait, wait <laughs> let me blossom. <laughs> Actually, Let me blossom. Actually, when I picture you in, like, just in your underwear, yeah. I picture you wearing leopard skin briefs. You know what it is? I don't, it hurts it, my balls. It, it just seems like, like, yeah. that's, that could be, that's you. I have tried it. Yeah. <laughs> that is real. I knew you at least tried it. I bought a tube of some once, because uh-huh. I thought maybe I'll try it, right? Like father, like son. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's the strip. Ah, yeah. The worst part is that fucking, it's, the, they're never comfortable enough on the taint. Get a size bigger. No, but then I now my dick and balls are just hanging out. What is the point of this? Tape your balls to your dick. What is this whole process? I just want to wear, I like my boxer briefs. Well, because of the gay porn and the bikini underwear, the media narrative became that this was some sort of gay sex game gone horribly wrong. Chicago homicide detectives, however, initially operated on an organized crime angle because Lee Meglin was in the Chicago real estate world, which had a fair amount of organized crime mixed in with the legitimate business. It's legitimate business. <laughs> <laughs> and specifically, they thought that the ham with the knife stuck in the meat left in the study, they thought it was a mob calling card. Let me there, think about this, guys. Think about this. Mob guys, fat, right? <laughs> Stabbing a... Knife into the ham. That's a fat man crime. (laughs) It's got to be the mob. It's the dumbest shit. But they also, remember, these guys knew the mayor of Chicago. Yeah. They sent... Lee Lee, Miglin did. Lee Miglin was, like, close with the mayor. And so... Is that Marion Berry? No, that's That's DC. DC. That was DC back in the day. I'm like, God, I wish. I wish. (laughs) This might be daily. I don't know. I don't know. Or that daily might be the 80s. I don't fucking know who the mayor of Chicago was in 1997. It's very important to the story. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Look it up. Yeah, I am. Look it up. But you know what's interesting is that the the, the mayor's wife sent flowers. The it was co- daily. It I was, was right. daily. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You know your fucking mayors, bro. I know what. I- <laughs> Fuck yeah. yeah. You know John Mayor. Uh, but they uh y- they the entire state was like this gets solved right the fuck 
now. I think they called it, it was like a red hot, they, like this one guy was like, you know, it's called a hot. No, they call it a red ball. A red ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah learned yeah, that yeah. from the wire. Yeah, yeah, it's like thing they met because the Cardinal called and said, what are we doing about this right now? So Andrew Cunan, and I think he knew what he was doing in that aspect by making it not only a notable figure, but humiliating the corpse in the first place, dragging all these other people into it, like this big old messy fucking way, like dumping gay porn on his corpse and do like it's it got messy very, very fast. Yeah. But after three days of chasing wrong, but I think reasonable leads, I think the organized crime angle was reasonable leads. Sure, yeah, even he if was the calling the sh- card was stupid. He was in the sh- skyscraper business. Yeah. Chicago police noticed a Jeep Cherokee parked less than a block from Meglin's home that had a whole pile of parking tickets on the windshield. The plates were called in, and after the Illinois and Minnesota police corroborated their evidence, the case officially became a multi-state murder spree, which turned the case over to the FBI. Now, with the introduction of the FBI came FBI toys, and the investigators were soon homing in on Andrew Cunanan using an old piece of software called Triggerfish that was used to triangulate the positions of car phones if they were being used. Yeah, dude, it's about tracking car phones. I, fucking, yeah. I miss car phones. Me too. Yeah, me too. Was, you, they're attached to your car. You want to talk to me. Uh, you got to do it while I'm in my car. I'm yeah. driving. Yeah, yeah, Once yeah. I leave the car. You can't fucking fuck, talk to me. Don't fuck talk you. to me. Fuck you. We can ring all night. We're bringing back car phones. I want <laughs> car phones. Give me a big fucking heavy bag. Yeah. Around Rotary phone, yeah, it feels like a club. Yeah. You know, a four-pound phone. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the phone in the Lexus required a code before it could be used, but that didn't stop Andrew from trying to use it again and again. This, of course, was how the FBI saw Andrew's path east, from Illinois to Michigan to Pennsylvania and finally New York. Now, incredibly, Andrew Cunanan had no criminal record whatsoever. That tells you how slippery he was. Well, also he, how he towed the line. Yeah. So he had no fingerprints on file other than a thumbprint for his you know, driver's license. This made it difficult to connect him to any of the crime scenes. And it was doubly difficult because the dum-dums in Minneapolis had left hundreds of their own fingerprints all over David Madsen's apartment. Additionally, it was difficult to recognize Andrew Cunanan because he looked like a different person in every photograph. Like we said last episode, like Ted Bundy. Yeah. And he was one of those guys who could pass for any number of races or ethnicities. And he'll tell you anything. He, yeah. Like he was, you know what I mean? Like he said that he was Native American. He said that he was like, he went, he tried a bunch of different things. Yeah. And besides all that, Andrew could speak multiple languages fluently. And with his talent for bullshit, he could have easily integrated into a community while all this shit died down. He could have even left the country. He spoke Italian. He could have gone to Italy. He had a bunch of fake passports. Yeah, and he'd brag about his fake passports. Not a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I can't believe he knew multiple languages. It seems like this is a guy who doesn't commit and doesn't learn anything. It's his photographic memory. Like yeah. He, uh, it, languages, it, because he, learned, he knew multiple languages because it came easily to him. You yeah, know? anything that came easy... Wink. He liked. Yeah. Molesto taught him. Molesto (laughs) always was there. (laughs) But that wasn't Andrew Cunanan's game. For him, this was all about making his big mark on the world. Oh, yeah, man. Spotlight's on me. Mm -hmm. And he was obviously loving every second of it. When his belongings were later found, it was discovered that Andrew was saving newspaper clippings of all his crimes as he committed each one. And then in the car he abandoned, he had left stuff. He left a couple of pictures. He had left those things, I think, trying to tell his little story to to the police so that they can tell the world. So he knew. Yeah, every car, there was something different left. He would have fucking loved the TV show. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But since Kunanim had was unsurprisingly obsessed with his own story, he soon discovered that the FBI was tracking him by car phone. Yeah. After the national media stupidly and irresponsibly reported, hey, this is how the FBI is tracking this guy. This is this thing, Motherfuckers, man. It's man. just the thing. It's hard because they want, you know, they get, they're trying to search for any detail they can get. And so they put it in, like, yeah, and it fucked them up. It's yeah. like when yeah. Geraldo, like, told the fucking ISIS where the, where the, soldiers where the Marines were. were. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. As quick as he could, Andrew tried disabling the signal by ripping off the phone antenna and completely dismantling the car phone itself. But little did he know, 
the actual signal was coming from the phone's power box in the trunk. He was also seen several times on the side of the road hacking at his own car antenna. Like there was, the, <laughs> there was multiple witnesses that saw him do that. <laughs> God damn it! Uh, you know me? I get destroying an antenna. I mean, nothing like, subtle about this. No, man. there no. is no. He is not <laughs> and that slippery. And that's the no. thing is those old car phone antennas. They used to be attached to the back windshield. Oh and yeah, they that came big like spring way thing. far out the oh, back. Yeah. So this is some maniac on the trunk of a car trying to just fucking rip How this thing How do you up. stop the talking? <laughs> <laughs> a spackle thing would have done well. It would have done really well. It didn't matter yeah. because the thing was in the center of the engine and he hasn't looked at an engine once. Or did a trunk? Eh, hey, whatever. <laughs> it's all the same. He doesn't know what it is. Regardless, though, Kunanen knew that it was time for a new car and a new location. He abandoned the Lexus near the Delaware Memorial Bridge near Pinsville, New Jersey, and walked to a nearby Civil War veteran cemetery in search of transportation. Well, they use horses. <laughs> I'm sorry. I love I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. That's good. It's, it's like I love that this then becomes Back to the Future 3, where it's like then it's his Western adventure. Honestly, I would have loved it. If this went all horse space yeah. for the rest of this, that would be incredible. Unfortunately, though, since Kunanen had already killed three people, he had most likely realized how easily murder came to him. And like many spree killers like Charles Starkweather, he also began to realize that murder was the quickest way to end an argument. And so when Kunanen walked to the cemetery, he found a 45-year-old Civil War reenactor named William Reese, who had been the cemetery's caretaker for 20 years. Reese was also unlucky enough to be in the cemetery's office on the day that Andrew Kunanen needed a new vehicle. Kunanen walked into the office, said hello, and asked for directions and a glass of water. But when Reese got up to get the water, Kunanen pulled out his pistol and aimed it at Reese's head. Reese was then ordered to sit back down and give him the keys to his truck. And after handing them over, Reese was shot in the head and killed instantly. Kunanen took off in Reese's red Chevy truck and left behind his checkbook, one of his fake passports, and more newspaper clippings about his crimes in the Lexus. Yeah, it's another high hello yeah. to the police. Yeah. Once the Lexus was discovered nearby, police found the golden saber casings of the William Reese crime scene and bullet fragments that matched those found at David Matson's murder scene. Now, with four people dead by Andrew's hand in three states, he made the FBI's 10 most wanted list and was even featured on America's Most Wanted. I made it! Yeah, that's exactly yeah. what he wanted. He's now national. But because of Andrew's admittedly impressive chameleon-like abilities, and because he quickly switched the license plates on the truck he stole, the trail once again went cold. Now, after Time magazine printed an article linking all the murders together and naming Andrew Kunanen as the top suspect, two of Andrew's friends contacted the FBI to tell them all they knew about Kunanen. When the FBI agent asked them where Kunanen might go, they had two words to say. Florida. Versace. And that's where we'll pick back up for the conclusion to our series on Andrew Kunanen. We're going to, to Miami. Miami. <laughs> you no, know, I, I, it, this, I, this story really does scare the shit out of me. Yeah, he really like he freak Andrew Kunanen freaks me out. That that the idea of a shapeshifter amongst you is fucking very frightening. Yeah, yeah. and he is, uh, you know, he he, but he also wasn't good at it. He's all willy nilly at this point. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, you know what we call berserker mode quite often is but, that like, the wheels are falling off. Obviously, the wheels are falling off. But also remember, like between the murder of Jeff Trail and the murder of Ver and Andrew Cunanan's capture, three months. Yeah, like he was actually very good at it. He was running for a while. Yeah. Um, and speaking of running for a while, I just want to say thank everybody who came out to <laughs> see me. At the Donner Party in Atlanta. It was so much fucking fun. I can't wait. We're going to do it again at some point. What did you eat? Uh, there was literal, uh, there was brains, and there was a whole charcuterie what man. What was the brains made out of? Meat. And then there was... was like tartar? Uh, yeah, I know. You'll know. You showed I think me that, pictures. That was, it was very cool. That was a vegetarian option. Oh. Um, and then we had like, you know, a, a bunch of feet cooked up like donor kebabs. It was so much fun. I can't wait. We're going to do it again at some point and I'll let you know when we do it. Um, and I'll also remind you to get the dang remote tickets if you don't want to see the Beach Blanket Bingo from yeah. your home. Go to veeps.com slash L-P-O-T-L and check it out. I think it's going to be fucking a lot of fun. Is yeah. it going to be live? It's going to be live. Yeah, yeah it's going to be And live. they get to watch it for a couple of days afterwards, yes. too, right? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be great. And I'm really excited. We got a bunch of plans for it. And I also want to announce, because we never really got to, 
is that our book is out. Yeah. Operation Sunshine is available. It's from Dark Horse Comics. You can get it from your local comic book store, which I think you should. I think that'd be really great. Is it individual ones or oh, is yes. it a full individual book? issues? It's yeah. two books of four. So it's yeah, got two, two runs of yeah. four. So we, this is the first four. There'll be a little break, and then there'll be the second. We four. call them two four-issue volumes Thank in you. the comic book world. Oh, very good. But it's, I'm very excited for this. I hope you guys like it. That's very cool. So this is your third comic book. Second. Well, the third, because we need the last comic book on the left. So yeah. this is like, we've been, this is our third, but this is the one that we're writing. We're really fucking excited for it. It is very cool that you're doing this. I love yeah. it. I love yeah, it. It's fun. It's yeah. one of my favorite things in the world. Hell yeah. Same here. All right. Hail, sweet Satan. Oh, hell gee. Be good to yourselves, everybody. All right. See you, fuckers. Hail me! Sure. Yeah, please. I'm sorry. I mean, you yell it. This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com. Yeah!